Dr. Persona, that you guys read, for this nice opportunity to this week. Keep going back, I like it so much. So it's great to be here. Thank you. Okay, so my talk today is on cosmic rays. In fact, you know, yeah, ultra high energy cosmic rays. Uh, you know, this is an old problem. Uh, of course, uh, Victor Hess discovered the cosmic rays going up and up the moon in 1912, but we're still not positive about what the sources of the cosmic rays are. Uh, OJ and uh, Rossi discovered the ultra high energy cosmic rays by looking at coincidences um, of high counters, spark, spark ch chamber counters on the ground. And uh, that was in the 30s. We still haven't established what the origin of the ultra high energy cosmic rays are. Uh, so why is it so difficult to, uh, even though we have huge amounts of knowledge about the cosmic rays, why is it so difficult to solve the origin of the cosmic rays? Well, it has to do with charged particles that get deflected in the magnetic field, so the cosmic rays don't deflect directly back to their sources. Now, uh, we can see the secondary productions of cosmic rays through gamma rays, uh, the interactions of the cosmic rays with the gamma rays, but we need gamma ray instrumentation, and the launch of the Fermi instrument has gone a long way to remedy our our knowledge to improve our knowledge of gamma ray astronomy and neutrino astronomy. So we, neutrinos will unambiguously point to these sources of cosmic rays, but they're very faint and very difficult to detect. So really you have to bring all three of these probes together to try to find and solve this problem the origin of the cosmic rays. And uh, presumably that will be solved uh, quite soon with uh, over the course of this decade, we're having lots of new instrumentation coming online, not only Fermi, but uh, the ground-based gamma ray astronomy telescopes, the uh, uh, OJ instrument, uh, as I'll, I'll talk more about, as well as the neutrino telescopes. So we have all this possibility to make, a, to establish what the origin of the cosmic rays, both the cosmic rays up to 10 to the 15 dB, and the cosmic rays going up to 10 to the 20 dB. But today I'm just going to talk about the <coughs> ultra-high energy cosmic rays, by which I will say greater than 10 to the 18 dB, the definition varies depending on the person. Uh, this is the outline for the talk. I'll give you a little bit of background about the Pierre Auger Observatory and what the results have been telling us about ultra-high energy cosmic ray origin. But what is easy, rather straightforward to show is that you have certain requirements for ultra-high energy sources. They have to be extragalactic but you have to be, have sources within a certain distance, the so-called GZK radius, which is the distance within ultra-high-energy cosmic rays can reach in zero to Earth. With the energy density uh, per unit time, the emissivity or luminosity density has to be at a certain rate just to overcome the losses. So you need sources that provide that amount of power. And you need powerful sources, because if they're not sufficiently powerful, at least using simple models of Fermi acceleration, you just cannot accelerate uh, particles. So those are the requirements for the sources, and they lead us to certain implications about what we expect these sources to be, but we still don't have the confirming evidence of what the sources of the cosmic rays are. Then I'll talk about what we know about gamma ray sources, what the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope is giving us the information on, and then I'll, I'll describe the most probable sources, radio galaxies and lasers as the sources of the ultra-energy cosmic rays, and gamma ray bursts as the sources of the ultra-energy cosmic rays. And my latest work on this is a paper on gamma ray bursts with Schroeder's author, Justin Fink, talking about electromagnetic signatures of ultra-high-energy cosmic rays and gamma ray bursts. So we'll try to get this accepted with major physics. We have a paper in New Journal of Physics where we try to make the case of uh, Centaurus A and radio galaxies from the sources of ultra energy cosmic rays that should come out soon. And uh, I have a book with Golden Men and which really generalizes this theme in a full uh, book size uh, development of the idea. So, so this will just overview some of the basic things. But just to make sure we all know the basic background of what we're talking about. This is the ultra high energy cosmic ray spectrum. Over here, so this is multiplied by the differential number of flux is multiplied by E cubed here. And certain features come out there. These are the spectral features that give us indications of uh, propagation, origin, acceleration, of the ultra high energy cosmic rays. So there's this so called me here now uh, at about 3 times 10 to the 15 TP. So 
this uh, above, above the knee, then you have a so-called second knee about three times 10 to the 17 degree, where it uh, softens a bit. So when it's flat in this uh, representation, it's EQ. So this is an EQ, E to the minus 3 spectrum of number. Then it's steeper, say E to the minus 3.3. And there's this very clear dip. So this is an important uh, hint about propagation or acceleration of this dip. And then it goes to the highest energies. Now, this is an old graph. In the last several years, the highest energies have come into focus as a result of uh, high res, Bourget. Um, and, and they have shown that at least the uh, early data from Agassa, Agassa, which suggested that there is some high energy excess extending beyond 10 to the 20 feet, it is probably it is not correct. There's this very strong cutoff above about 10 to the 19.6. So this is a so-called GZK cut, cut off, which is predicted some time ago, as I mentioned. So right now. <coughs> so soon after the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, Bryson, that's happened in Cleveland, pointed out that due to energy losses through photopine production of the CMB, you should get an into the cosmic ray spectrum. And this just has to do with the fact that protons will make pions, and those pions are an energy loss process, so that <coughs> protons, due to the very strong energy losses of, in the cosmic microwave background radiation, lose their energy, and so you should get this cut off. They also showed, uh, when you take into account the possibility that the ultra energy cosmic rays are nuclei, you also have associated energy losses, giant dipole resonant losses, and you still get this cut off. So this was a prediction in, in 66. This is the extra galactic background light, not only CMBR, but you have some dust component and a starlight component. But it's straightforward to do the calculation of the energy losses. And this is what the energy loss mean free path curve looks like. So you get this very extraordinary, so this is the characteristic distance scale for a particle to travel and lose a fra fraction E of its energy. So you see how rapidly it declines when the ultra high energy cosmic ray protons start to interact through pine production with the cosmic microwave background radiation. So you get this very steep drop or very small distance from which the sources can originate from. But this is the main free path. Uh, and I'll mention that's a little bit misleading. But you know that it's not very sensitive uh, to the different uh, extent of the extra black and background light, which isn't completely well known. So this was just a phenomenal, phenomenological fit to the high and low energy extension of the extra galactic background light. But uh, even you know, 25 years ago, Hillis pointed out that the ultra high energy cosmic rays probably were of extra galactic origin. And his basic idea is that uh, and, and this has become known as the Hillis criterion. If you have a, a source that's accelerating the ultra high energy cosmic rays, the Larmor radius has to be uh, of, of, of the cosmic ray itself has to be smaller than this size scale of acceleration or confinement. And here's the Larmor radius in terms of a characteristic microgas field, 60 eV, which is where this um, GCK cutoff really starts to set in. And it's about 65 plus parsecs for protons. It would be smaller for a 3 microgas magnetic field. But here, for a 60 eEV particle, you can see that the proton would have a huge far more radius, so it would have to originate from outside the galaxy. Now, it could be iron nuclei, uh, and it's, it's still not positive what the ionic content of the ultra high energy cosmic rays is. But all the same, the Hillis condition, as noted by Michael Hillis himself, already rules out many potential sources of ultra high energy cosmic rays. Uh, Flare stars, white dwarfs, normal garden variety, 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 13th Gaussian neutron stars, and galactic sources. Although people have supposed if they're iron, maybe you could get some uh, galactic sources to make the ultra high energy cosmic rays. Now, uh, over the last several years, the Piero J Observatory, which has been built over the last decade, but they've been having the data releases. So they had a major data release in 2007, but the Piero J Observatory is a hybrid observatory. It, when, when you observe ultra high energy cosmic rays, you can do it in one of two ways. You can have shower counters to look at the showers, 
or you can be use optical monitors to look at the nitrogen fluorescence that's excited as the ultra high energy concentrates cascade. <coughs> and the Agasa detector was a fluorescence detector, the high res was a shower counter, and they had these disparate results. So it's clear that to really resolve this, we needed a hybrid detector involving both uh, shower counters and uh, fluorescence detectors, and that's what they have. So they're always uh, spectroscopy detectors, uh, 1600 spaced 1.5 kilometers apart. Uh, they have uh, four uh, arrays of nitrogen fluorescence detectors in this rectangular resolution of about one degree for 10 to the 90 dB particles, and then the energy is going to be 22 percent. Now, 2007 is the birth of charged particles, Johnny, or at least it's often hailed as that, but the birth is a little bit uh, exaggerated given uh, the more recent. Uh, data releases, but what, what uh, the OJ folks did is they took a catalog of active galactic nuclei by Veronche and Veron, and then they correlated the arrival directions in these large circles with the locations of the active galactic nuclei in this catalog. And the first thing, okay, these are exposure uh, uh, indications of more exposure here, and, and you can see very clearly that the arrival directions are anisotropic. And also that they seem to correlate, to some extent, with this uh, distribution of active galactic nuclei, which are clustered along the supergalactic plane. So there's this extended uh, matter concentration within 100 megaparsecs, the supergalactic plane, where we have enhanced AGMs, <coughs> galaxies, uh, and, and they, they do t tend to cluster there. And, and they announce that there's a correlation between the arrival directions of cosmic variance greater than about 6 times 10 to the 90 dV with active galactic nuclei within 75 megaparsecs. Now, as I mentioned, this correlation is not strengthened in their more recent data release they announced with Denver APS, uh, which is a bit of a puzzle, but it it's, hasn't gone away either. But it, it always suggested in my mind that this is just a tracer of matter. And what this is saying is that the ultra high energy cosmic rays follow the tracer of matter in, within 100 megaparsecs, not necessarily AGMs. But let me also point out that there is this enhancement toward the galaxy Centaurus A, which is very fascinating. There's quite a few objects there. Cine is the nearest active galaxy, 3.5 megaparsecs. And this enhancement hasn't gone away. It has actually improved. So that, that is a real question. If it's near Cine A, then Cine A is a probable source. Let's see if we can make a model that explains it as a source. But there's another issue here. In order to have this correlation, uh, you can't deflect the particles as they enter our galaxy much due to the galactic magnetic field. And that deflection increases. I mean, all they measure here is the total energy. They don't know what the ionic uh, state of the particles is. But if it's a highly charged ion, it's deflected considerably more. So even for z equals 1, you get a deflection of a degree or so, well, like 3 degrees in the three of gas magnetic field. So once you go to highly charged ions, this correlation is completely washed out. So this points to the likelihood that uh, these uh, ultra-high energy cosmic rays are protons or light ions. But if they're protons or light ions, that means that the mean free path, or, or the distance from which they come from, has to be attenuated to get this GCK cutoff. So um, I, I just showed the calculation of the mean free path. Um, the, the characteristic distance of particle will travel before losing uh, a fraction e of its energy. But for protons, that mean free path is 140 megaparsecs. Okay? And, and, that, that, and that's at 10 to the 20 TV. So if you naively assume that the mean free path is the defining quantity that determines the distance, then it doesn't make sense that these uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays would be protons. But that's a bit misleading because the mean free path is a distance a particle with energy goes before it loses a fraction e of its energy. But what you really have to ask is, what is the distance a particle with energy e times e had to reach us here? So that's the more realistic quantity here. And, and, and so if you define the horizon distance as the linear distance that a proton or an ion travels before it loses an energy EE, you get something quite a bit 
different and quite a bit shorter because after all, uh, the, energy, the mean free cathodes is very rapidly changing function of, of energy. So if the mean free path were constant with energy, this horizon distance measured this way and the mean free path would be the same thing. But if you define the horizon distance this way, then the distance from which particles measured with energy E or originally had energy E times E is much shorter. And now it makes sense that cosmic ray protons could uh, be produced within the GZK radius, lose their energy. Right? If you just take the mean free path and you'd assume that the sort of GZK cutoff or the, the extent of the sources from which you would detect 10 to 20 PV particles would be 140 megaparsecs. But using this definition of horizon distance, it's down to 50 megaparsecs. And it, now it, it, it makes sense that pro, ultra high energy cosmic rays could be protons when you use a horizon distance definition this way. Uh, they're also, uh, I suggested this approach, or I, even though it's pretty obvious, uh, but, but there are many model dependent definitions of the horizon distance in the literature. So it's consistent with these being uh, protons. But then we also have the question of if we need sources that can produce sufficient energy to power the ultra high energy cosmic rays. So you see the cosmic rays, they lose their energy quickly, and then you just have a simple relationship between the uh, energy density we observe, or the energy density observed, the emissivity or luminosity density, and the loss time scale. So, and this loss time scale is simply related to the horizon distance. And you can take the observations from OJ and convert that into a, a, a luminosity density in terms of their, their values here. And you can and you find what this sort of luminosity density you need to power the ultra high energy cosmic rays. At 10 to the 20 TV, it's 0.4 times 10 to the 44 Hertz per cubic megaparsec per year. 10 to the 19, it's 0.8. 10 to the 18, it's 3. So you don't need a lot more luminosity density to go many decades down because the mean for the horizon distance increases so rapidly with distance. And this characteristic luminosity density uh, that was pointed out by Waxman and McCall is being required, and Ellie was right here. So. But then we need a mechanism to accelerate uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays. Now, there are two main approaches in astrophysics. One is Fermi acceleration mechanisms, where you have some sort of stochastic energy gain, either through a shock in a first order scenario, or through moving magnetized media in a second order scenario. Ultimately, you have electromagnetic scenarios. But here I'm going to focus on Fermi mechanisms. And this, is, again, is a very si simple approach to the, uh, what, what you need, well, a, a simple way to get the luminosity required of these sources uh, and of course but, but it gives the right results from which you can actually do much more detailed calculations and recover this value and depending on the details of the system you get uh, some coefficients but if you have a relativistic wind with luminosity L then the energy density is reduced by 4 pi r squared times the speed but it's also 1 over gamma squared and one, one factor of gamma is because this luminosity is contained in relativistic particles. The other factor of gamma has to do with the fact that you're working in the co-moving frame. So this gives you the internal energy density of the wind in the proper frame. And if you relate that to the magnetic field, you can infer a magnetic field given the, the power of the wind. Now to get the maximum particle energy, you use a plus type calculation that the maximum particle energy is uh, charged magnetic field, characteristic distance, but then when it leaves that site, it picks up another factor of gamma as it, it leaves the system. Now you can relate the characteristic uh, distance in the proper frame by Lorentz contraction, and so you get this R over gamma. You put those together, and the maximum particle energy that you can uh, reach in a relativistic wind goes to something like the luminosity or the power of the wind in units of 10 to the 46 hertz per second uh, divided by gamma. And of course, it's, it's much greater if you have a, a charged ion. But there are difficulties, with, as I just mentioned, for charged ions to be the 
sources of the ultra high energy cosmic rays. So now this reduces to what extra galactic sources have a parent isotropic, okay, luminosity greater than 46 turns per second. So I sh should make this distinction. I'm using a parent isotropic luminosity here because you know I have a spherical shell, but it could, could just as well be beamed. So the apparent isotropic luminosity is just the luminosity that one would observe in some portion of the shell. But if you ask what that absolute luminosity is, it's still in that fraction of the opening angle of this wind. So that's, that's the difference between apparent isotropic and actual luminosity. So it's only the apparent isotropic luminosity in the, in the outflowing wind that you're exposed to. But then the question becomes, if you have the sources of ultra high energy cosmic rays, they have to be buried in 10 to the 46 Earths per second. And of course, we can find those sources by looking for sources that have gamma ray luminosity buried than 10 to the 46 Earths per second, because gamma rays are non thermal emissions, cosmic rays are non thermal, and therefore this should get point us to the possible sources of, of ultra high energy cosmic rays. Now, the Egret experiment gave us our first real view of the gamma ray sky, the full gamma ray sky. Uh, they saw 270 sources greater than 5 sigma. This is the 3 EG catalog, 5 spark chamber gamma ray bursts, 70 high confidence quasars, the normal galaxy, uh, our galaxy, the LMC, and Centaur C. We also now know 25 places with ground-based telescopes. But we've gone well be beyond that with the Fermi, which was just launched a year and a day ago. So yesterday was its first birthday from uh, Cape Canaveral, formerly last. So this just illustrates its, this was its launch, and it's renamed the Fermi. And I, uh, it consists of two uh, main systems, the Large Area Telescope, sensitive between 20 MeV and greater than 3 MeV, and the Gamma Ray Burst Monitor, which has uh, simulator detectors, sodium iodide detectors, sensitive from 8 kV to 1 MeV, and BGO detectors from 100 kV to 30 MeV. So this provides capabilities over seven orders of magnitude in energy, which is fantastic. Let me just give a little bit more detail uh, about how it works. It's a paired intrusion technique. A photon comes in, it converts it to an electron positron pair, and then you track the electron positron pairs, and then it deposits its energy in the calorimeter. Uh, of course, the anti coincidence detector surrounds it, so if you have a charged particle, it will excite your semiconductor, and, and if you see a coincident uh, detection in the in, in the layers in the tracker, then you reject that, you veto that because it's a charged particle. The gamma ray won't excite this anti coincidence layer, so you, get the, you, you can veto the charged particles that way. The tracker has to have both thin and thick layers for conversion and also for trackings, and so they've uh, optimized it to get good angular resolution. So you have to avoid mul multiple scatterings, so that, that's why you want thin layers, that's what you want thick layers in order to get efficient conversion, so it really has to be optimized. Now the calorimeter, uh, of course, hit, uh, the Royal Institute here in Stockholm University, uh, we were instrumental in constructing that along with Franz and my institute at Naval Research Laboratory, and you need enough uh, uh, stopping distance to contain the shower so that you can accurately measure the uh, total energy. So this is the first sky, light sky map, taken over four days, equivalent to a full year of, EGRIT, uh, of data from EGRIT on the Compton Observatory. And this is an orthographic projection, so you can see you know, some bright sources coming through, giving you know, the crab, uh, the Cygnus region, there's the band, and there's the bright label 3C454.3, they were the brightest source in the sky. This is what it looks like if you put it in a hammer atoff projection. And it shows the same sources I like just pointed out. But now let's get back to the, the problem on hand. In order to accelerate the ultra high energy cosmic rays, what do you need? Well, we're saying that the non thermal gamma rays are pointing us to the likely sites of 
ultra high energy cosmic rays because mm -hmm. non filled gamma rays imply that you have relativistic particles and intense photon fields. And this is a cartoon of a standard uh, jet model where you have acceleration of both leptons, which are very efficient radiators, they will make radio, optical, or x ray non thermal synchrotron radiation. But at the same time that you accelerate the leptons, you should also accelerate hadrons, protons. And the protons can uh, radiate through the same uh, processes that uh, we talked about with respect to the GZK cutoff, photomason production, and it would produce a second gamma ray component. So then, in order to identify the sites of ultra high energy cosmic rays using gamma ray astronomy, you have to be able to understand the difference between the emission signatures of hadrons and leptons. And so this is a major focus of my research to really develop the models to, to, to know what are the differences between hadronic and leptonic emission mechanisms. Now, starting first, let's look at the radio galaxies and blazars. So, uh, of course, there's huge amounts of phenomenology associated with, uh, with these, but we think that uh, there are two main classes uh, defined by the radio luminosity. There's the low luminosity twin jet structures called uh, FR1 radio galaxies, and there are the high luminosity FR2 radio galaxies, so these have, are lobe dominated. And if you happen to be looking down the jets of these FR1 galaxies, you get a so-called BLAC object, a low luminosity uh, jetted, highly variable uh, blazar. By contrast, if you look down uh, the jet of a something like Sigma C, presumably in the unification scheme, see something like uh, 3C279. Uh, th these would be, okay, uh, this would be the parent population of these sorts of objects. And you see these very extraordinary, highly variable radio through optical synchrotron, and then this uh, other component, the gamma ray component, which varies on short time scales one day. But it has extraordinary luminosities, apparent luminosities, and that's what we're talking about, the apparent luminosity. Since they're beamed into a small fraction of the full sky, their, abs their absolute total luminosity is the beaming factor times that apparent luminosity. But for particle acceleration, all we need is the apparent luminosity. And it reaches, in some cases, 10 to the 48, 10 to the 49 Earths per second, so well over the 10 to the 46. Now, the BLAC objects tend to be considerably dimmer, or okay. this magnitude. But some, Marcarian 421 is only 10 to the 45 orbs per second, but there are other BLAC objects, like parts 2155, which reach 10 to the 46 orbs per second. Uh, so, well, okay, so the technical definition of what distinguishes them is based upon optical emission lines, but uh, I don't need to go into that. So we see that at least for a certain class, for both classes of blazars, there are sources that are sufficiently luminous that they could accelerate the ultra high energy cosmic rays. But do they have the luminosity density within the GZK radius? Well, this requires actually doing a statistical calculation of the sources you see and adding it up and making an estimate. And for blazars, well, first you have to know this is our, still from the eager days. Uh, the distribution and redshifts of the BLAC objects in the flat spectrum radio quasars. So what I did was I, I did a calculation of the statistics using beamed radio jets in order to, to determine what the luminosity density of quasars is. But to make it very simple, uh, if you look at the gamma ray fluence from these sources, so you just go, go through the eager catalogs and now we can do it with Fermi data much better. We look at the total radiation that reaches this per square centimeter per second per stradient, add it all up in all four pi stradients, and then get an estimate of the characteristic distance they come from and divide by the volume. You have a simple estimate of the luminosity density. You do that using the eager catalog and, and you get 10 to the 45 herbs per cubic megaparsec per year. So I have this factor 0.2 here. So I, I use the diffuse extragalactic isotropic gamma ray emission. But I, when I did my statistical calculation, I found that the actual contribution of blazars was considerably smaller 
then the presumed total intensity from uh, that eager measure, so that's why this factor of 0.2 is here, and the, the characteristic location of FSRQs is where the, the luminous uh, galaxies is average of one. But, but, but it wasn't, it's enough in principle. You do the same thing for BLAC objects, and you also get, and here you also have a small contribution. But since they're closer, um, you have a smaller volume, and you also get a characteristic uh, luminosity density of 10 to the 45 per distribution. <coughs> so, in principle, uh, you have enough luminosity density from these sources to accelerate the ultra high energy copper grays. Chuck, about which luminosity are you integrating? Just the gamma ray luminosity above 100 MeV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what is the luminosity of the sources? There's a luminosity function of you, in which you integrate. Right? All, all we can say is that the luminosity of the sources has to be much greater than the gamma ray luminosity. So this is a minimum condition. If the gamma ray luminosity works in the luminosity no, source. I'm asking a different question. If the, if the, individual, the luminosity of the individual source is much, much smaller than 10 to the 46 hours per second, they're not relevant for the cosmic ray acceleration. And I'm quite certain that almost all this luminosity comes from sources which are much, much weaker. Not for the flat spectrum quasars. They're all much. So the flat spectrum quasars will all be above 10 to the 46 hertz per second. Now you're right, for the BLAC objects, quite a few, as I mentioned, will be about 10 to the 45 hertz per second. Yeah, not the mechanical power that being, so if, if the radiative efficiency is not. Uh, Indeed. Uh, if they don't produce any photons, they can do whatever you want. No, I, I, I appreciate, I mean, your point is right. If the gamma ray luminosity is well below 10 to the 46 hertz per second, then, then you could argue that they're not relevant to this calculation and they should be subtracted away. And to, so there are other issues that, that are even, even more severe. But, well, for the BLI topics, that, that would produce this number because I haven't made that subtraction. <coughs> Okay, just a side issue. Uh, I mean, how do you explain this? Well, it's difficult, even if you had star forming galaxies. So we'll see what the final result is from Fermi in that case. But, but now we have a new data set to, to play with. And then this is the Fermi bright sources. Uh, so Fermi has released uh, their first three month source list of bright sources greater than 10 sigma sources of which there are 205 uh, large area telescope bright sources. Uh, and also they've released the list of the uh, so-called light, uh, lat dry AGM sample, the LDAS catalog, which consists of 132 sources greater than 10 degrees, 114 of which are associated with AGMs. So this is a three month uh, catalog. And you can compare with Egret over the, the entire Egret lifetime, there were, were only 31 greater than 10 sigma sources to compare with the 205 lat source, red sources. And there were only 10 of the galactic latitudes greater than 10 degrees, which can be compared with this 132. So you can see just already in the first three months of data, we've so far outstripped the, the Egret results that they've become you know, of only historical interest. And this shows the 90-day uh, movie, and you can see AGMs flaring up and going away. If you look, okay, so this is looking from the north, uh, from the north galactic pole and the south galactic pole. So the ridge here represents the emission from the galaxy. Uh, and if you look closely, you can even see the sun pass through here. We need a darker room, but anyway, the sun passes to be very dark too. Okay, so uh, <coughs> Justin Fink and Schroeder Zock and I sat down and, and did this calculation of the luminosity density of blazars. <coughs> so we just basically calculated the luminosity of the apparent isotropic luminosity of each blazar. So that's the luminosity in our line of sight, but presumably there are objects pointed away from our line of sight that would compensate for the ones we don't see. Uh, we knew their distance, we divide by the volume, and we have this cumulative luminosity density of uh, 
radio galaxies from the LBAS catalog, the bright HU catalog. And you can see for FSRQs, okay, so here's the this 10 to the 44 Hertz per cubic megaparsec per year line. Uh, the FSRQs, <coughs> sorry, the uh, BLAC objects are here. Depends strongly on whether you add SEN A or you don't add SEN torse. But in either case, extrapolating to low redshifts, you see that there is plenty of uh, luminosity density for the BLAC objects. Uh, keeping in mind that is an uh, important point that not all these BLAC objects will be have greater than 10 to the 46 or it's per second apparent uh, isotropic luminosity. By contrast, if you look at the flat spectrum radio quasars, even though they're much more luminous, they're also much less numerous. So by the time you get to low <coughs> redshifts, uh, the actual luminosity density within the GZK radius here just barely is within 10 to the 44 grows per cubic megaparsec per year. And it's not clear that there are a sufficient number of sources within the GZK radius. So this points, in my mind, to the more, it's more reasonable to suppose that the BLAC objects, the, low, the lower luminosity versions of AGNs, if they are the ones that accelerate the ultra high energy column craze, <coughs> are more likely to be the sources of the higher luminosity radio densities. But then there's this, well, so, so let's look at the arrival directions of ultra high energy column craze. And I try to associate them directly. I mean, they've been reflected by intergalactic magnetic fields. They've been reflected by galactic magnetic fields. But they still are associated with the AGNs, at least in the first data release of OJ. And you see quite a few within the vicinity of Centaur say People have gone through each and every arrival direction looking for sources. There, there's a good number near FR2 radio galaxies, uh, some FR1 radio galaxies. Uh, which, and th those sources could, in principle, accelerate them, and then the particles be deflected into lobes so that we see them. Uh, but there are also quite a few ultra high energy cosmic rays whose arrival directions don't correlate with any obvious radio galaxy, but only if they're correlated with an AGN, or they're correlated with low, low luminosity non radio galaxies. So that's a real puzzle for anyone who tried to tries to advocate that the ultra high energy cosmic rays solely come from radio galaxies. But since Centaur A is the strongest candidate, it, it, it pays to actually look at this in quite a bit more detail. Now, this is what Centaur A looks like in a uh, multi-wavelength representation. So you have a, some radio lobes here, and then optical, and I think there's also x-rays that we can use to construct this image. Now we know we need this 10 to the 46 ergs per second of apparent power to accelerate cosmic rays by Fermi processes. If you, if you just go through the literature and sit down and write what the powers are, so the radial luminosity is 4 times 10 to the 42. That's non-thermal. The gamma ray power from Fermi is only 5 times 10 to the 41. The hard X-ray soft gamma ray power is larger, but that could probably be quasi-thermal emission from the accretion just near the black hole that's powering these jets. And then you have ultra-high energy cosmic ray power of a few times 10 to the 40 hertz per second, which, which is actually what's detected from it. So that, that's very low. So how do you make this the case? Well, so we said, let, let's actually do a calculation of the, the lobes. Uh, from, from the lobes, what the average depth power of Centaur A is. Now, typically, when people do these calculations of what the power of the black hole to, well, what the black hole power is required to uh, create these lobes, they use cocoon dynamics. They consider the total energy in the lifetime. And it's rather model dependent. So we, we had this, well, we approached this differently. But we did, we, when we looked at SEN A, and uh, this is a W map data at 20 gigahertz, what stood out to me is that, well, you can see it's much brighter on one side than the other side. Now, this is all synchrotron radiation at the lobes. This is powered by the black hole, presumably. So whatever the average, whatever is powering that is, is coming from the central source. You can use standard Compton synchrotron theory 
to get the minimum magnetic field, and then these equations are well known, well established. But Salati and Fabian also pointed out that you can calculate the jet power from this minimum magnetic field, but you need to know the speed. I mean, you're basically, you have at least two components to the power, one from the magnetic field, and one from the particles, the electrons that radiate uh, the synchrotron radiation. But on top of that, you need the speed to find, cl close the system of equations to get the power. How do you get the speed? So we suggested you use the jet counter jet asymmetry. If you interpret this, this dimming and this brightness as due to some uh, motions away toward or away from the observer. And, and when you do that, you get something like, in this region, it's, uh, it's moving at about 0.2c to make this jet counter jet ratio. And here it's about 0.1c. This is a little bit brighter than this. And using those speeds, we derived a power, a jet power, that is making the radiation of the lobes of about 10 to the 44 hertz per second. Now here it's absolute power, it's not apparent power, it's a total power, right? But if you talk about apparent power, this absolute power can be put into a smaller opening angle, a smaller jet. So you could easily increase this apparent power by a factor of 10 due to the smaller jet. And, but to actually reach 10 to the 46 Earths per second, you need either a factor of 100, so a very small jet, and that's not obvious at all from Centaur say. It's, it's got a really wide-angle jet, so a factor of 10 is okay for the difference between a parent and absolute power, but 100 is a bit more. But then you can invoke uh, episodes of strong activity. It's not a very satisfying argument, but we're puzzled. We ourselves are puzzled why Centaur say a fairly weak radio galaxy is apparently, you know, we see the arrival directions from ultra high energy tropic areas. Uh, and so, how, how do you get such powers that could accelerate this? So, you really have to stretch it, but you could, in principle, argue that Centaur say produces apparent jet powers of 10 to the 46 birds per second in the areas. But the other way to, to establish it is to actually look for the hadronic signatures in, in, uh, in the emissions from uh, the hadrons and radio galaxies. And these are the standard leptonic laser model when you have a relativistically col collimated outflow uh, within this plasma that's moving at some bulk or factor. You have a magnetic field that produces synchrotron radiation, self the same, those same electrons upscatter the radiation to take self compton radiation. On top of that, they use uh, Compton scatter photons produced uh, in the disk or scattered in broad line region material. So, this is a typical calculation for a leptonic model. You can get the two nice components, you get this Compton component here. But the question is do we see anything? What would you do for, you know, what do we expect from the hadronic component? So, Armin and Atoyan and I have been making calculations of the hadronic emission signatures for some years. So the idea is on top of the leptonic components of the jet, you also accelerate a hadronic component uh, to, a, to an energy such that the marble radius has to be smaller than the characteristic size of the region. And those protons will uh, undergo photohadronic losses to make ions and, and secondary radiation. So they only neutrinos, gamma rays. And importantly, when those protons interact with photons to make ions, they charge convert about 50% of the time into neutrons, and those neutrons escape, they decay, they become the ultra high energy cosmic rays. So, so here we have neutrinos, which of course have not yet been detected but then the gamma rays. So what are the gamma ray signatures? And then the prediction is the ultra high energy cosmic rays would be protons. They would be charged ions because the charged ions, well, in this particular formulation, they don't escape. <coughs> uh, and we also pointed out the advantage of having a broad line external radiation field for efficient photohadronic production. Because if you just try to deal with the synchrotron photons of the jet, it's, it's much weaker. 
So on, on this basis, we predicted that flat spectrum radio quasars, the very luminous quasars with the strong radiation fields would be more likely sources of the ultraviolet cosmic rays. Uh, these are the sort of calculations we have. We inject a power law distribution of protons. Those protons undergo photohydronic uh, production, making escaping neutrons, which escape from the blob and, and go out. So here it is in just two different parameters. They also make a, a flux of ultra high energy gamma rays that, that escape the source. Uh, and that, that's given by this dot dash line here. And in this particular calculation, the protons are almost, the protons in the jet itself are almost completely degraded by these losses. It depends sensitively on parameters. But it isn't, in principle, feasible in, in a blazar jet to have accelerated protons, which then make secondaries and to make the ultra high energy rays. And this is a sort of gamma ray emission signature we calculate. It's a photohydronic cascade calculation. It depends, again, on the surrounding radiation field, which attenuates it. But you get a gamma ray hydronic signature with a spectral index. So these are all Compton components of the cascade, synchrotron components of the cascade. But it's sort of a, it, has, it rises in UFU, either it's 0.5 or rather flat in UFU, constant. So, so the characteristic feature of a gamma ray signature of hydronic acceleration in blazars is that you get this radiation signature only at the high energies. You don't get it at the low energy signature signature. So it's the, these are called, should they be detected, orphan gamma ray flares. And such flares have been detected in a few cases. And people have argued whether that's the hydronic emission signature. All you get is the radiation at the highest energies because, of course, hadrons won't accelerate in the lower energy regions for that. You need the leptons. Uh, but I will have to tell you, uh, we, I mean, the Fermi mission is still in its early stages, but we, we haven't identified very clear orphan gamma ray flares. It requires uh, a full collaboration to look at the multi wavelength spectrum. So it's still only a few cases where we have those sort of. Uh, multi-wavelength capabilities and coordinated campaigns. But this is what we're looking for to, to identify hydronic acceleration. But if this process were to take place, then those protons, which have decayed into neutrons, the neutrons escape, plus you have the ultra-high energy gamma rays, they leave the system, they go out, uh, the neutrons then decay, and they deposit their energy from the beam dinner jets on size scales of one kiloparsec to a megaparsec. The gamma rays deposit their energy, so they do have this ultra high energy gamma ray uh, uh, component, which then converts to electron positron pairs by interacting with surrounding radiation fields. It deposits its energy also at distant scales of 10 kiloparsecs to a megaparsec. So this shows a, the characteristic distance that gamma rays propagate at, at these very high energies. So 10 to 10 kiloparsecs to megaparsecs. And so, so we can ask separately, what would be the signature of such a process if, if it were to exist? Well, the signature is you've had this production of ultra high energy cosmic rays, secondary neutrons, which take collimated, which are collimated and flow out and they deposit their energy, they should be very linear signatures. So this is a mechanism to make very linear structures because the neutrons flow out of having to do with the collimation of the jet, and they deposit their energy, assuming the black hole over the course of you know, remains gyroscopically stable, which undoubtedly it will. And so Armin and I have argued that you see these very linear structures in a few cases, pick the ray, uh, even Cygnus A shows some. That might be a signature of the escaping neutrons and gamma rays, which then deposit their energy uh, along the jets. It provides a mechanism to power the jets, uh, other than just having straight plasma outflow, which goes to large distances. So it's a separate mechanism. Uh, but how do you prove that? Ultimately, the way to demonstrate that is neutrino detection. 
So the detection of a single neutrino will, uh, from a, a laser, will indicate the, the strong importance of hadronic production, neutron escape, and I'm talking about neutrinos of 10 to the 50 pp, sort of energy range where ice can be sensitive to. But, okay, I, I'm not going to spend much time on neutrinos, that's uh, already my time is uh, coming to an end, but let's now talk about gamma ray bursts. Well, there's a lot of phenomenal being associated with gamma ray bursts, and, and there's not only the long duration GRDs, which is what we usually think of when we talk about them but the short part class of gamma ray bursts, coalescence of compact objects. And this was demonstrated by the SWIFT mission that the short part class of bursts are related to whole stellar populations, low luminosity bursts, x ray flashes. So, so it's, a, it's a complicated field. But what we can do, we can take, uh, and this is something that Dmitri and Waxman did and really started the interest in the possibility that gamma ray bursts could accelerate the ultra-high-energy cosmic rays by looking at, by doing this emissivity calculation. So if you take the total fluence, and this shows the fluence of uh, nearly 2,000 gamma ray bursts detected by BATSI uh, during its lifetime, you add that fluence up, you can assume what its characteristic distance is, in this case, it would be sort of redshift one from our knowledge subsequent to that. We think this is what they get. And then do this velocity <coughs> density calculation. You get right around 10 to the 44 hertz per cubic megaparsec per year. So it's right on the border there of the, what's needed, but you also need some such sources within the GZK radius. But, but it's, it's, it's feasible. And uh, I followed this possibility up with, with some co workers. So the nice thing about gamma ray bursts is you can argue that they, their injection of, of ultra-high energy cosmic rays would be rather constant from gamma ray burst to gamma ray burst. It doesn't change a lot through cosmic time, which sure, certainly wouldn't be the case for blazars because the supermassive black hole changes in mass, the environment changes, but a gamma ray burst could be, in principle, rather a stable object. All you need to know is what the birth rate is as a function of redshift. And we, we did that calculation with all the energy losses. And you get the GZK cutoff. And you get this dip. This dip feature is due to hair production. This is a point uh, Rosinski has made over the course of the years. And you can get a very nice uh, spectrum for the, uh, for the gamma ray burst, or for the ultra high energy cosmic rays from the gamma ray burst. And so you can test ultra-high energy cosmic gradient origin hypothesis by detailed fits. And, and this just shows that it depends most importantly, well, at least as importantly as any other thing, on the star formation rate history of gamma ray bursts. And the general assumption is that the gamma ray burst star formation rate history follows the high mass star formation rate history as uh, identified the, by the blue and UV luminosity density. So this is Hopkins and Beacon, the their latest estimation of the star formation rate with cosmic time. So this is number four, and this curve number four gives a reasonable fit to the ultra high energy cosmic ray spectrum. But to actually confirm uh, that, uh, in the absence of neutrino evidence yet, that ultra high energy cosmic rays are powered by gamma ray bursts, we need to look for gamma ray signatures. And again, first you have to go through leptonic modeling, and uh, people have done this for dozens of years. This is my version of the leptonic model with uh, Jim Chang and Marcus Bircher, where, where you have these two components. I mean, here we don't have a photosphere component, it's just a simple strong forward shock model and an external shock. And you get a synchrotron component and a self talking component which rises up and then decays away. So you can see it has a very generic behavior in this very simple external shock model. You can make it more complicated as you like, but then the question is, how do you identify a hadronic emission signature? How do you separate that from a leptonic emission signature? And here, let's, let's bring in the Fermi data. So the Fermi 
can't reverse as of 090510. I, I took this from Shenanigan Glenn's uh, talk in this program. Uh, there are now uh, eight uh, lab detections of uh, gamma reverse as of this day. They tend, but not always, they tend to be the very highest fluence of gamma reverse. Uh, and, and these are the, one, the ones in the red were seen by the lab, the high energy detector on Fermi. And you can look for this fluence ratio in, in the expectation that they might be separated. So this is the high energy fluence to the, compared to the low energy fluence. But there is this extraordinary gamma reverse, the 80916C. So this happened uh, last September. Uh, and you, you can see you know, suddenly you have this splash of gamma ray photons at very high energies, even exceeding 1 GeV. So this is before, during the burst. And from this amazing gamma ray burst, there's lots of notable firsts. It had the largest number of high energy photons from the year of oh, greater than 100 energy photons. So it's good for spectral studies. Uh, there's a redshift 4.35 at a distance, very outside the GCK in this uh, large fluence. It had the largest apparent isotropic energy release, nearly 10 to the 55 hertz, <coughs> which supports the black hole jet paradigm. It had a very high energy photon from which you could determine using opacity arguments of the jet Doppler factor because you can reduce the opacity of the emission region by having it moving at high relativistic speeds. This is implications for extra black and black and light models and with some quantum gravity. But what I'm going to focus here is a very significant delay between the onset of the 100 MeV and the 100 KeV radiation. It's four seconds. And, and I think this is a very strong clue that cosmic rays are Cosmic ray hadrons are accelerated in gamma ray bursts. So, this is a way to 916C light curves. So, here it, it turns on between 8 kV, 260 kV, and up to 5 mV. <coughs> but quite a bit, well, several seconds later on, finally the high energy radiation turns on. Now, this is also seen in an earlier burst, the first burst seen at the lab, the way to wait to 5C. There was also this delay. So this delayed onset is characteristic of these two bursts and several others. In fact, no, no, it's even seen in short gamma ray bursts. There's no violation of the fact that the high energy radiation turns on several seconds after, in, in long duration bursts after the low energy radiation, several tenths of a second in short hard bursts. Also, it has extended long lived high energy gamma rays seen in both which is also seen in both the long duration and the short part gamma ray bursts. So how do you interpret that? You could just say, oh, you know, some shells, if you take a standard gamma ray burst model and it's colliding shells, well, some shells have different parameters. So in some shells it's soft and some shells it's hard. And that would be okay, as well, but we always see systematically that the onset comes after, uh, later. But if you're just arguing for some happenstance of different shells and in, in some cases the, the onset should you, know, you should get the high energy emission from the first set of shells, not the second set of shells. So unless you argue for well for some other mechanism, this doesn't work. You could argue for opacity effects that it's completely opaque early in the gamma ray burst, so the gamma, high energy gamma rays don't get out. But later on the high energy gamma rays start to emerge. But we never see a spectral softening. It's, it's more consistent with a single power law. And, and then it changes to a much harder power law at later time. There's been some other mechanisms to get this delay of scattered cocoon emission. But what we argue is what we're seeing is the delayed onset of the high energy radiation due to the acceleration of ultra high energy cosmic rays, which it, there's a certain amount of time to, to get accelerated. It takes longer to accelerate protons than electrons. And then those protons have to build up okay, until they become luminous in the lab band. So if this is the electron synchrotron component, and this is what was measured in the first time interval before the hard component, and then you let the protons build up, it takes several seconds to finally start 
to see the proton synchrotron radiation sweep into the lap band. So, so this is our explanation for the delayed onset, that we're seeing a systematic buildup of the protons as they get accelerated and accumulate and radiate through proton synchrotron radiation. And it, it tends to be proton synchrotron radiation, not photohydronic radiation, because we see such high energy photons that the bulk of its factor has to be so large that uh, actually photohydronic production tends to be very inefficient. So we argue that the Fermi data is revealing the existence of ultra high energy cosmic ray acceleration in long duration geodes. At the same time, how do you explain the extended high energy radiation? Well, uh, and, and this is a generic feature of gamma ray bursts. Now, there are a number of mechanisms, a delayed arrival of the self compton but we don't see a distinct self compton component or cascades in the intergalactic medium. But we, Marcus Birch and I pointed out a long time ago that due to the much, uh, <coughs> much less efficient radiation losses of hadrons compared to electrons, that you will have a more extended hadronic emission feature, uh, an extended emission from the hadrons compared to the leptons. And, and that would be at high energies and not low energies. So that is what's important to explain that. OK, uh, we've done hadronic models uh, for gamma ray bursts. Just like in blazers, you get the neutral beam of neutrons, gamma rays, and neutrinos. Uh, and this just shows one of our calculations, so just the neutrino signature and the, and the photon cascade signature. Uh, but, and, and our predictions for neutrinos, which were rather positive for ice cube, but now we see from the Fermi data that the Doppler factor, the gamma factor, is much larger than 100, more like 1,000. So we're being pushed in the direction of proton synchrotron versus photohydronic processes to explain the observations. OK, so I've come to the end of the talk. That was the basic outline. Uh, we are making progress in understanding the origin of ultra high energy cosmic rays. Lots of sources are rolled out, especially with the latest OGA data. The particle physics sources, the, the top down models, they, they, make, they, they don't fit the data. Clusters of galaxies are rolled out and on the basis of the arrival directions. Galactic sources. What remains viable are jets of AGNs, radio loud. But it would be a puzzle if radio quiet AGNs. But it's also a puzzle, as I pointed out, that SNA is a strong source. You really have to push the parameters to, to have it, give it the power. And at the same time, other radio galaxies like M87 do not show an enhancement of the right direction of the rays. Now for gamma ray bursts, I, I didn't go into this point, but uh, it has the luminosity, it certainly has the luminosity that's capable to accelerate the ultra energy cosmic, cosmic rays. It has the luminosity density, but the number of sources within the, within the GCK radius requires a very strong intergalactic magnetic field to disperse the arrival directions. So given this, gamma ray bursts, in my opinion, remain a very viable candidate. But if people have argued magnetars can also work. But um, the bottom line is, I, I think it's certainly by no means demonstrated that ultra high energy cosmic rays are accelerated by black hole jets. So, uh, why these? Uh, they're exclactic, powerful, they have the emissivity, and we don't have the neutrino detections in yet, so the best hope to solve this problem is happening as we speak with the accumulation of data from the Fermi Gamma Space Telescope and the new. And the and the new data releases we're expecting from Moshe to point toward the sources themselves. So I'll stop right there. Thank you.
it's, it's a bit hard to see on this, but it's, it's very distinct domain onset of the, uh, of the higher energy gamma rays compared to the lower energy gamma rays. So, is that what you're asking? Yeah, it's, uh, it's within the, within the burst, but you're saying the, the start is... Yeah, the, 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 you see the burst continues, yeah. in this case, 40 to 60 seconds. And what about these uh, photons emitted at much later times? Well, it's a difficult problem. It's because you've accumulated all these protons. The electrons, your injection starts to decline, but it hasn't ended. But, but the electrons immediately radiate their energy, so it, it gets reduced. But then the protons are still there to radiate their energies on a much longer time scale because they lose their energy so much uh, less quickly. So it's just a difference in the decay time scale. The, the acceleration time, if they are confined then by definition, the acceleration time is roughly the dynamical time that you describe this, right? Uh, well, I consider there would be, in a gamma reverse like this, continuous injection, right? I mean, you, you, you don't see any distinct rise and fall to the background. So you have a continuous injection of electrons and protons. But the electrons will follow this injection behavior. But then the protons accumulate and, and, and will radiate on a much longer time scale as a result of their slower cooling time scale. Other questions? Uh, uh, Chuck, you have shown uh, uh, your expectation for those alpha-n flares from VLX to contribute to the uh, uh, gamma ray signature of uh, very high energy production. Uh, have you looked also, is there some flares which were in the time of the uh, Compton gamma ray observatory? I do believe that 97 flare of uh, VLX was showing just exactly what you expected. <coughs> You're talking about the work of the of the yeah. uh, Indeed, indeed, that that's started the excitement where they saw flare in gamma ray energies, but they couldn't see an associated. Uh, they saw no associated flare emissions at the lower radio to optical energies. Okay, yeah. And, and so there's an argument. Was that, yeah. And there are even some neutrinos detected at that time, but the, the people don't accept it. Okay, or even Francis also doesn't uh, push that very much. Yeah, so you indicated at the end that the prospects for right were that way, but I didn't understand the argument. I mean Well okay so Ice Cube reaches its design sensitivity in 2011. Uh, obviously if you have strong photohedron hydraulic corruption, you're going to get the neutrinos. You need strong photohedronic corruption. But to get strong photohydronic production, you need a dense internal radiation field. If you have a dense internal radiation field, then you expect the gamma gamma capacity to be strong. Yet, the Fermi results always were seeing these very, very high energy photons. We see no indications of a gamma capacity grade, which would be, you know. But, but, but there may be occasions when it's so completely attenuated that the internal region you won't let the gamma rays get out, and only the neutrinos escape. So, so there's also this anti-correlation between the production of gamma rays and neutrinos. But in the intermediate sense, we expect that there would be opacity cutoffs. We haven't seen any opacity cutoffs. So it suggests that the outflow is highly relativistic, which has a low internal radiation field, and that's not good for photoelectronic production. So that's the argument. Okay. Are there no further questions? Thanks for taking